Welcome back to LaunchPod. Today, we have two Next alumni sitting down to talk about the ins and outs of bootstrapping a startup. If you like what you hear, remember to tell a friend. Hi, everyone. My name is Visha Vijayanand. I'm the Alumni Success Officer for Next Canada. I also run my own venture, Posh Posh, on the side. It is an e-commerce store selling women's clothes with pockets. I was so fortunate to get introduced to Next Canada through the Next 36 cohort of 2018. And today, I'm very excited to introduce Michael Chang, CEO of Lumen5, also a Next 36 grad, but from 2013. Hi, Michael. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to meet you and have you on the podcast. Can you share with us a little bit about yourself and the company that you started? Yeah, sure. So since starting Next36, I've built a few ventures with my partners. Our most recent one, uh, we started about two and a half years ago. It's a company called Lumen5, and it's a video creation platform that combines artificial intelligence and a simple user experience to allow anyone without video editing experience to create video content for social media and marketing purposes. That's amazing. And can you tell us a little bit about how you met your co-founders? I, we met in the Next36. So back in 2013, uh, Next36, as, as uh, listeners of this podcast might know, um, is a part of the Next Canada program that brings together 36 aspiring young entrepreneurs from across Canada. Uh, and that's where we met, right there in Toronto. Oh, that's amazing. So how, what kind of synergy, synergy has allowed you guys to become co-founders? I think what worked really well for us is uh, both my co-founders, Chris and Nigel, come from an engineering background. So they're really good at building technology and building products. I come from a product design background in UI and UX. So we naturally work together in terms of building products where I come up with ideas and, and the designs for how the user can interact with technology. And they go on and develop very, very complex and powerful technology to power the ideas that we come up with. That's brilliant. And it sounds like your team has really evolved since your days living at the grad house and working out different ideas and iterating. So when you guys were thinking about really scaling a venture, what kind of things um, did you see when your roles changed? Yeah, so our roles continue to change every day, and I'm sure it'll change over the next few years as well. Um, of course, when we first started out, it was the three of us where uh, I would do most of the design work and then Chris and Nigel would do the building. Now we're a team of 30, and that means our roles have changed. Uh, Nigel's running the engineering team, which is about 10 to 15 people now. Chris runs the product organization, which includes uh, product design, but also product management in determining the product roadmap. And I run the business organization, which includes sales and marketing, HR, and the customer support and so forth. And so much of our roles have become um, dedicating our time to the multiplier effect. How do we empower others to do the work that we started? That's amazing. And can you just tell us what inspired you to become an entrepreneur in the first place? I think entrepreneurship is is fascinating because it, it allows you to solve all sorts of different problems. And I think at its core, entrepreneurship is all about problem solving. And founders tend to be people who live life being brutally aware of all the problems around us and can't hold themselves back from going out and solving those problems. Uh, and I think that's something that's always driven me and uh, it's something that drives Chris and Nigel as well is just our, our constant desire to solve problems. And even though you know, you're know you a couple of years into business, the, the deeper you go into any one industry or any one problem, the more problems you find. The closer you get to your customers, the more problems you hear about. And that's what product development is, in my view, is you're building solutions to an, an ever-increasing volume of problems as you understand the space. Uh, and the market itself changes too, so the nature of problems are always shifting. And the, the role of the entrepreneur is to continuously solve those problems and make lives better. Very well said. And I think that's true just from your repertoire of, you know, starting Snipply and then Lumen5. Could you just tell us a little bit about Snipply? Yeah, Snipply is a, is a very unique product that allows you to add a call to action to the links that you share. Um, and it's targeted towards the content marketing link sharing uh, space back when you know Twitter was, was first ramping up and, and link sharing was a key um, uh, content marketing strategy or social media marketing strategy. So the problem that we identified at, uh, for Snipply was that people were curating content and sharing all these links, but they couldn't really identify what the return on investment and how to track the effectiveness of content curation and sharing links to other people's website. So Snipply created a unique opportunity to allow them to then add that call to action, be able to track that click-through rate, uh, and be able to provide analytics for their content curation efforts. So it was solving that specific problem. And did, would you say that Lumen5 was born out of the learnings from Snipply? 
Absolutely. And, and in so many ways, I feel like every venture was born out of the learning of the previous in some shape or form. With Simply in particular, the synergy was quite strong because we were selling to the, the marketing teams of the world. And at Simply, we had built that product to over 500,000 users, which means we had insights across so many different marketing teams. And what we saw at that time, and this would have been around 2016, 2017 range, was that uh, the, the customers that we were selling simply to, which are all marketing teams, were starting to see this rise in video content and the importance of rich media, multimedia content. And so we saw that need to create videos quite a few years before videos actually exploded onto the scene. And that gave us a lot of insight to be able to preemptively build the technology that the market needed. So watching the market signal and seeing that video would be the next big boom, what is your competitive advantage with Lumen5? Competitive advantage wise, one thing that we've always done well in across most of the products that we've worked on is this uh, a very succinct user experience. And we're very product focused founders and very product focused team. And so, you know, for the first two years, I would say there was no, no investment in marketing, uh, no investment in, in many of the business functions. And really it was all in on the product. And it's crafting the user experience from the start to the end. And it's something that I think we're really passionate in and is designing good product. And when it comes to a problem like Lumen5, that's extremely important. Having a good user experience applied to a workflow that's traditionally very complex. When you think of video editing, not a lot of people know how to do it because the software tends to be very complicated. Uh, Most of the people who do video editing are professionals who went through years of training. And so really abstracting that video editing experience into something that's point and click, drag and drop, making it smooth, that user experience uh, can, can be as simple as, as really anyone can use it. Um, and one of the, the key differentiations that we developed in the early days is this idea that we thought that marketers would enjoy turning blog posts into videos because we knew that for years, marketing teams have developed archives of blog posts and evergreen content. Um, and so the big ambitious idea that we tackled was how can we just simply using a link to a blog post, help them turn it into a video. And that became the fundamental AI differentiator and also the proprietary technology that we built. Uh, and that uses, uh, in a nutshell, natural language processing that goes through text-based content combines it with visuals like videos and photos and music uh, and tells the story so that the users can post it directly onto Facebook, Instagram, or wherever they need. I think there's an interesting juxtaposition with what you just said with that your platform enables content creators better use to create their content and share their marketing messages. But you for Lumen5 didn't actually choose to go the route of, you know, doing a lot of marketing. It was more word of mouth. And you also bootstrapped your company, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there's, um, there's a strong belief among our team that marketing is something and sales is something that you do after you have built something worth marketing and worth selling. And um, I, I think it can be very difficult if you, if you try to market a product that's not quite ready. And from our view, it's, uh, you don't need a lot of marketing resources or sales resources to get your first 10 users, to get your first 100 users. And if the first 10 and first 100 really truly enjoy and love your product, it shouldn't be that hard to get them to recommend you and refer you to a few other users and get your first 1,000 users organically. And following that mentality, focusing on product and bootstrapping, we built the business to about 250,000 users before we start to spend a single dollar in marketing. That's really interesting that you say that. Um, Recently, I was on Upwork's platform looking for a virtual assistant for some of the tasks that I needed to get done. And I noticed that a ton of people were listing Lumen5 as an area of expertise on their Hmm. platform, saying that, you know, as a freelancer, I leverage this technology to be able to quickly share content. So that was really interesting to see. Yeah, that's that's actually really interesting. It's not even something that I, I had noticed. So thank you for sharing that with me. Um, and there, that in and of itself is a cool story. In the very early days, uh, I was on Fiverr, which is a similar platform, but it's $5 for tasks. And uh, this was prior to Lumen5 being publicly available. I was on Fiverr offering video creation services. I was going to make videos for people for $5. Of course, I would be beta testing uh, the, the very early versions of You Lumen were the 5. AI. I, yeah, I was the AI. Uh, and so I was part of that that kind of freelancer ecosystem in identifying that product market fit. And it's one of those things that we were able to do as a bootstrap company on minimal resources. How do we then test the product uh, in an existing marketplace? And that's what we did with Fiverr. That's amazing. And I just wanted to, you know, educate our audience in case anyone doesn't know what bootstrapping means. Could you just explain it to them, please? Sure. Yeah. In general, people, when they say bootstrapping refers to building a company without 
uh, investor funding, without outside funding, uh, mostly just means that you're 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 building and scaling the business based on um, either no money or revenue from your customers directly. And is this different from how you built Snipply? Um, it was very similar. I would say the key difference is we bootstrap both of those products and companies with the key differentiator being um, at Snipply, we were much more conservative in how aggressive we were spending. Whereas at Lumen5, we spend a lot more aggressively because the intention is to build something much bigger and grow a team that's much larger. And so the, the, the expenditure behaviors were quite different and therefore the growth rate was quite different as well. So what we learned from Snipply was bootstrapping is great, but it's hard to build a very large business if you spend like a bootstrapped founder. And uh, with Lumen5, really what we're trying to do is to bootstrap, generating revenue from our customers and relying on that to scale the business, but really spending a lot of money um, into growth so that we behave and act like a venture-backed company. That's a very insightful uh, tactic that you've just mentioned. But that doesn't mean that you didn't see an amazing exit with Snipply as well. Could you just share a little bit about your success there? Yeah, I think the the exit was a great experience. Um, I th- I think part of what we've done because we focus so much on the product and the core technology, uh, it was a very attractive business to be acquired. And when we were going through that process and going through um, a different potential buyers, the feedback was all the same: was that uh, it was amazing that the product kind of grows on its own. Um, and because we bootstrapped it and didn't spend any money in marketing for the entirety of the of the growing to 500,000 users in Snipply, we didn't spend any any marketing dollars at all. The team was also extremely lean uh, and, and there wasn't a lot of baggage or, or staff that buyers had to really worry about transitioning. It was a self-sufficient and self-sustaining platform that grew on its own and has grown on its own for years and will probably continue to grow on its own. And that made it a very attractive acquisition for buyers, because if you have a business that relies heavily on certain marketing channels and there's huge expenditures involved to be able to sustain that growth, um, you will have to factor that in into the valuation of a company. For us, we we just built the product. People love the product. They tell their friends about it. And that that's how it's grown. And so the economics was very healthy. That does explain kind of the positive aspects of bootstrapping and seeing how you can keep your operational costs very low. The thing that I'm wondering is also around the negative aspects of bootstrapping, especially for SaaS companies to close that sales cycle and make it through the end of that sales cycle. Could you just elaborate a little bit about how you made that work for Lumen5? Yeah, I think it's um, important to note that bootstrapping works um, differently for different types of businesses. So for us, building technological products with a strong product and engineering founding team allows us to get all of that done without necessarily acquiring a lot of resources. Now, take, for example, let's say you have a full non-technical team, but you want to build a technical product. It's a lot harder to do that without funding. So partially, I think in the early days to maximize the effect of bootstrapping, really, you want to maximize the skills of the founding team. If you've got three engineers as your co-founders, great, you can spend all of your personal time, um, blood, sweat, and tears building the product without having to raise capital to hire an engineer. So that's something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is for technological products like ours, cloud-based, internet-based, there's not a lot of costs other than our ability to code and to design. But if you're building, let's say, a physical product and there's a prototyping and manufacturing material costs involved, There's different cost structures to building different types of businesses. And so bootstrapping may not work as well if you're working in an industry that's high cost, such as if you're developing a a new drug or a new hardware technology. So those are some things that that, uh, create limitations or so-and-so downside for bootstrapping. I do understand that having these higher expenditures can create you know, a di- more difficult time bootstrapping. But I'm also wondering if your technology just takes longer to get in front of the customer, even if it is a very lean product, or it takes time for a customer to actually pay for the technology because you still have to make that convincing argument. Mm-hmm. How um, you might have worked through some of these things when you were building out your business. Yeah, I think um, it's, in my opinion, and why I continue to bootstrap businesses is in the, in the very early stages where you're still trying to find product market fit, Money doesn't necessarily help because money isn't often the bottleneck. 
And really in the early stages, you want focus. You want to be able to talk to five people and really understand their their whole workflow and how you can make it better. You want to build solutions and get a couple people to really fall in love with your product. And then you want to get five more and then 10 more and then 20 more. And so in my view, the early days is very focused and it's very uh, chaotic. You're shifting directions. You're doing slight pivots on the product on, on, a, on a daily basis almost. Um, and the way I view the, the challenges of growing a business and scaling is, is what's the current bottleneck? And at a certain point in time, once you have product market fit and you need to scale it, you need to put it into the hands of more people, money then does become the bottleneck because it's more about distribution. But in the earlier stages where it's really about research and study and implementation and prototyping and experimentation, oftentimes if the founding team has the capabilities to quickly uh, iterate on the product, the bottleneck isn't necessarily money. And I would actually argue that if you went out and spent a million dollars on ads and got a lot of people coming through, it could actually distract from the product discovery process. It's much easier to listen to the feedback of five people than it is to have to wrestle with the conflicting feedback and suggestions from 5,000 people. And I see how you framed the idea of like product discovery around iterations rather than thinking of them as mistakes in order to learn more about your customers. Yeah. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how you took those learnings and actually address the needs of your customers? Sure. Um, the product development process, in my view, is a very human process. And uh, it's, it's never, you never really see it as a mistake because nobody truly knows what the solution is or could be. Even as you're working with potential customers and, and users, they don't always know what the solution needs to be. They, they know what the problem is. And knowing the problem allows us to then start ideating. Here are 10 possible solutions to this problem. Let's narrow it down to three. Let's prototype those, get it, get it in front of the users. What do they like? What don't they like about it? Uh, and in each of these iteration cycles, I think what's most key is the user will like some things and not like other things. And so what you do is you continue to double down on the things that they do like. You continue to either get rid of or improve the things that they don't like. And it's a very step-by-step uh, -step approach where you're, you're showing them prototypes, you're getting feedback, you're building them new prototypes and so forth. And I, I would argue that that continues to happen to this day, even as a 30-person company. That is what we're doing. The scale of which we're testing new features is accelerated. We test with more customers. We test more features with different customer groups. But the, the iteration process hasn't changed. And how do you sustain that ongoing growth and momentum by leveraging your team? I think that the growing growing of the team allows us to start bringing in a lot more expertise. So people who uh, have built a career in product management, for example, who understands the best framework for assessing the, the reach and impact and effort scores of, of each feature rather than just building by gut feeling. And I think that's, that's one of the fundamental shifts of a founder-based um, early stage bootstrap company and a scale stage 30-person company is you... Uh, because there's a lot more people involved, you have to take a much more data-driven approach. Documentation becomes much more important. Communication across different teams becomes much more important. But when done well, they're able to generate insights at a much faster scale. They're able to talk to uh, an increasing variety of customers at a rapidly growing pace, where in the earlier stages, I might focus on building for five people. Nowadays, we're thinking about the real estate industry. We're talking about to um, publishing companies like Forbes and Time Magazine also massive tech companies like Salesforce and Oracle. And they all have different unique needs and desires and problems. Their workflows are all different. Um, and we need a, an increasingly larger engineering team to service each of those verticals. So that's what scale looks like. Really, it's just a, a multifaceted version of what we were doing in the early days. And this is a bit of a touchy subject for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, I just wanted to know if you have an opinion around taking the salary when you're bootstrapping your business. Uh, I think so. I mean, it is, it's, it's really based on personal preferences and lifestyle. Personally, I rarely take a salary in the earlier stages. Uh, I don't think we took a salary until very, very late into the venture. And even now we're definitely not the highest paid employees in the company. For me, I think the, the, the founders are there to build equity value and build vision and build the, the, the kind of grand solution that you have in your mind. Uh, and really the salary is to make sure that you have your needs met uh, during that time where you're building heavily using your blood, sweat, and tears, whether you're working eight hours a day or 12 hours a day. But because different people have different needs, I, I do acknowledge that some founders will have families and they'll have children. And, and so salary becomes a necessity if savings can't cover those costs. But it does become a struggle. I think it is a, a, a great benefit for early stage entrepreneurs to minimize their living expenses as much as possible. 
And I recall in the earlier days, I wasn't really eating that much and that was okay. And uh, <laughs> living was modest and transportation was mostly just walking. Right. Uh, and that, that alleviates the pressure of, of having to work for extended periods of time without income. And do you think that has anything to do with founders trying to start their businesses in big cities like Toronto or Vancouver, where you're located, um, versus just starting it in their university campuses, et cetera? I think there's definitely benefits to, uh, I, I, I would say the key difference would be living at home versus living on your own. If you're starting a company while you're still living with family, a lot of those expenditures can be cut down. So early stage founders will see a lot of benefit because a bulk of the cost really is in the rents. Uh, When it comes to food, there's so many ways to hack your way around and and not spend that much on food. Um, And entertainment and and leisure, those are things that you can easily cut. So it does come down to rents. And if if you're living on campus, that tends to be a little cheaper as well. It's when you start living downtown somewhere, that's when the big city expenses really really affects your lifestyle. So if you're living in New York or Hong Kong, that means you you pretty much either need a lot of savings or some form of salary to pay for all of that. Um, so especially building digital businesses, I definitely think living in a cheaper city will probably help reduce that pressure. And is there some tactical advice you can impart on our younger listeners who are entrepreneurs looking to really break into a market? I think starting early would be my best advice. As as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, As you get older, there's just inevitably more responsibilities. You move out, you have your own place, um, maybe you start a family, and if you have children, those are all all things that, that requires resources, and you can't as easily build ventures for years without salary. Uh, And I think starting early is also great because I think it does take a long time. So if you look at the kind of full history of my journey, Lumen5 is probably somewhere around my 13th or 14th business. And that's a lot of failures along the way for me to build off of. And I was able to, to do that because I started very young and started failing and learning very young. And, and it's been over a decade for me to get to where I am now. And that's why I always recommend people to start early um, because it, it will take a lot longer than you would expect um, when you're reading the news. And it sounds like all these startups are finding overnight success. Uh, but most of the and it's time, been like you, 10 years in the making for a lot of these. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And many of them are 10, 15 years. Uh, and so it's, it's important to acknowledge that. And if you're about to start on a 10 year journey, uh, it's always better to start early. I would definitely add to that too. Like if you're noticing in the market that certain companies in a very specific industry are being sold or acquired, that that industry is probably saturated now. And Mm. there are some key players that are exiting and probably the the shift is now to a newer industry. So I'm just curious, what is your entrepreneurial moonshot? What's the next for you? I think Lumen5 has a lot of potential. Um, So on the surface, uh, for most of the market, what people view Lumen5 is this video creator. But really what we see is we're building technology that makes it easy for people to tell stories. And that's uh, somewhat of an evergreen concept. Companies, people, brands, businesses will always have a need to tell their story. And brands revolve around story and the kind of emotion that they want to evoke. And what we're doing is building technology so that they can keep up with the times. And currently we're in this evolution from photos and, and GIFs to video. Because mobile hardware and mobile data has made it so that we're all carrying mini televisions with us everywhere we go. And so we're building the technology so that businesses can connect with consumers in the way that they want to receive information. Um, but that never changes. It eventually will evolve into VR and AR as the primary method of, of consuming information and communication. And as technology becomes more complex and more multifaceted, uh, more, more complicated technology is going to be required to help the everyday person be able to produce content in those increasingly complex medium. So I think Glimmin 5 is, is a journey that will walk for, for a lot longer. And can you just tell us a testimonial of a customer that you've had that has been able to successfully leverage your platform? Yeah, I think one of my favorite example is Forbes. So Forbes, and hopefully, you know, people listening to this podcast have seen Lumen5 videos before. We do power many of the Facebook videos with the moving text over top of video. Oh, I've um, seen that on like Business Insider. Yeah, that's right. Forbes, Time, Economist, those are all uh, our customers as well. And uh, hopefully you've seen many of those videos. And Forbes is a great case study because they were one of the first to adopt Lumen5. And what they were looking at was they were behind on, on their social engagement compared to other publishers and their competitors. 
And um, for most of these publishers, creating a video takes about a week, even with a dedicated video production team. And generally, they cost thousands of dollars. And it's ironic a- because they use a lot of that time to figure out the sound when most people don't even use sound <laughs> in their videos. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, but the the case study there is using Lumen5, Forbes has been able to cut down their video creation time down to under six minutes per video. And that means they can produce more videos across more channels on a daily basis. And all of their analytics are showing that they're now in the lead. They are the number one publishing brand because of their ability to produce volume-based videos that are engaging, just as good as their, their high-touch videos that they were creating in the past. And we're seeing similar performances with some of our newer customers as well. And so customers generally have the ability to track their progress on Lumen5 and see analytics around that as well. Most of the analytics um, are available on the social platforms themselves, so we don't dive too deep into it. What we try to do is really focus on what we're good at, and what we're good at is the video creation process. Analytics are generally made available on Facebook itself, on Twitter itself, on LinkedIn itself. They all have their own versions of analytics. Um, inevitably, at some point, we will dive into our own suite of analytics, but that's part of the bootstrapping journey is you can't work on that many things. You have to focus on the one or two things that you're really good at. And we've um, really picked our focus as the video creation process. You're definitely quite the dream team over at Lumen5, having already founded a successful venture and now on to the next. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I think you've imparted some amazing knowledge around bootstrapping to our audience. If there's any last things that you want to add around just inspiring the entrepreneurial community, feel free to step in right now. Great. Yeah. I mean, thank you everyone for listening. Bootstrapping is a uh, kind of a daunting journey, but it's a lot of fun. It forces you to focus and, um, and it really teaches you to work on what matters. So I definitely recommend uh, for anyone who's holding back from starting their first business because they feel like they don't have the funding or the resources to do it. My advice would be to, to find the right team. If you have the right team, Money shouldn't be the bottleneck because most of the time money is used to hire the right people. But if you have the right co-founders, then you can bypass that altogether. Uh, And I think most companies can be started by two or three people. And if you find the right people, money wouldn't be the bottleneck. Thanks for tuning into LaunchPod. We're so proud to be part of this community doing such great things to move our country forward, but our reach only goes as far as your support. So please download and subscribe to amplify the voices doing the hard work to advance Canada's entrepreneurial ecosystem. 